Man, there's so many blogs now. I think we should make like a spreadsheet or something. Just <laughs> like everybody's on there. <laughs> it's so great. Did everyone make their blogs because like I think it's 3100 that makes you make a blog. And then I think a lot of people just realize, hey, this is kind of fun. Is it really? Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool, actually. Or at least I'm taking 3100 now and they're pretty much saying like, oh, yeah, make a oh, blog. Oh, yeah. That's father, dude. It was a blog on what what you would call it? Google Sites. Yeah, it's yeah. Google Analytics. Uh, Google Analytics. Google. Not a fan Taylor? Why? Google. Google Sites. What about GitHub Pages? Site Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever floats your boat, but I, I like GitHub pages. Yo, Gabe, dude. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Oh, what? It's my block. What the? <laughs> Cover tops. My name that lives in infamy. <laughs> Oh yeah, for anyone who is signing in, you don't have to fill out any form. Um, <laughs> once, you, uh, girl, why? <laughs> once you click the link, you should be good to go. Oh, hi, Herbert. I see that you're in here. What's up? What up? Long time no see. Haven't hopped in in a while. Oh, welcome Figured back. that drop by. Yeah, for anyone here who does not know Herbert, he used to be part of Swift Eboard last year. He also makes music. Hey, Lamar. <laughs> hey, Lamar. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, too. Did anyone want to go to Second Sky? You guys could. Oh, I went. <laughs> nice. Did nice. No, I did. I'm going to the the concert. I was too lazy to arrange stuff to go out. Mm -hmm. to so, yeah. What, once it was announced, I was like, I had to go. Okay. Good. Let's get started. So, hi everyone. Welcome to another Swift meeting. We're going to be going over intro descripting. It's going to be a collab with Dot Script, which we will uh, mention about a little later. But uh, first, some announcements. So um, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, so um, once again, it's not too late to become a paid member. You're going to get a bunch of cool swag. Like, I got some tech symposium shirt right here, so it's pretty nice. This is like a super comfy shirt. So um, I recommend that you become a paid member to get more comfy shirts and comfy pajamas. Um, we call you can qualify for prizes. Uh, we actually have those those cool raspberry pies with um, all the things included with it. Uh, those are worth like about a hundred bucks each. So if you become a paid member, you have a chance to win one of those. Um, we also have a mentorship program, which is still on the way, where you can get one on one uh, mentoring with an industry professional, as well as access to our RVB um, beta testing, which is adversarial and defensive simulation that we use to train high schools with. Um, yeah, Robinson's already won lots of Raspberry Pis. And there's a, there's a lot of other cool stuff on the way. Uh, it's not too late to become a member. You can go into this link to register and uh, become a member, $20 a semester or $35 for the entire year. Yeah, with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Gabe 
and some of the folks on dot script to um, lead the meeting. Thank you very much, Taylor. Uh, but before we get on with the meeting, we're actually going to have a quick introduction of the dot uh, slash script crew. Uh, so, uh, when need, you want to yeah. just briefly in introduce your guy or yourself? Mm -hmm. So, hi everyone. We are dot slash script, and we are a computer science club, and we focus on security, reverse engineering, cryptography, incident response, and pen testing. Um, this is our treasurer, Shivam. Shivam Singh, um, our president is Edwin Lee, and I'm Wendy Nguyen, and I'm our vice president. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, Edwin is a little bit tied up today, so he won't be here, um, but he will be with us for the workshop, so you could uh, meet him then. And now we're going to start off our general meeting with an intro to scripting presented by myself my fellow eboard member, Luis, and all the wonderful people at dot slash script. So here we have a overview of what we're going to be covering today. Uh, we're going to be covering all the basic stuff of you know, scripting in general. And we're also going to show you how to like, implement or use these things inside of both Bash and Python. So you'll have a couple examples and little activities throughout um so yeah without further ado let's kick things off with luis take it away wicked thank you gabe very much appreciated um so hello everyone very nice to see some new faces out there and some familiar ones as well as always so i guess without further ado let's just jump right into the content right so what is scripting um that's pretty much going to be the section that i'll be walking uh with you guys right now and pretty much answering that question right uh but before i do i think it is important to understand um really what it isn't for the most part um don't worry about my spinning friend we'll get to him in a second but what scripting kind of uh when we're talking about scripting right what we're not doing is application development and that's um to kind of like summarize on that end what we're really not doing is taking into consideration different things like writing an application we're not taking things into consideration like user input and compiling code so to speak uh, and, and what have you right so for our intents and purposes, what we're using scripting for, for the most part, is more like a shortcut, right? So by definition, scripting is the automation of individual tasks. So I think a good example to illustrate that is uh, what we just had with my little spinning friend there for a quick second. Um, it, it looked like a seamless process, right? Um, but really under the hood, if you guys see that graphic that was under, um, the main thing, I actually had to go in there and manually input command by command, exactly how long this should last, um, pretty much like how many sequences there should be, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a good example as to what scripting is really good for, and that is automating tasks like these. So we don't have to go through um, the manual work of having to input so many you know, different um, settings and such. So next slide, please, Gabe. So thank you. Um, and so pretty much like what are, the, what are some of the tools that we, uh, will help us like, you know, be able to accomplish that automation, right? And so if you didn't read this, <laughs> uh, the slide already, or I mean, our, our presentation, we're gonna be going over uh, Bash and Python. Um, and so kind of like taking into, uh, the main reason we're, we're choosing these two is mostly because you guys are primarily gonna be seeing this at some point within your IT careers. And, um, so it, it's important to kind of like be familiar with how these two are different and how they kind of work in tandem with each other sometimes. Um, but in general, Bash is a command line interpreter um, that is more or less ingrained and defaulted into most Linux flavors and distributions. While Python, on the other hand, is more of a standalone programming language that is based off of object-oriented uh, programming. So with all that being said, uh, a lot of fancy terminology, I know. But the thing to understand really is not, um, is not to say which one is better like in general, but kind of it, it relates more to the situation that you're going to be using this in. So it, it kind of really depends on the scope of the project that you're working on. So taking just two general situations, right? Um, say you wanted to check uh, like all the password or you wanted to change all the passwords on uh, all the users on like your Linux machine right now and stuff. Something fairly simple. You have a text file and you want to just go through it. Bash is probably going to be your better option because it's a quick and dirty method to honestly just get through it, right? If it's a pen to paper code, then Bash is going to be your better option to handle, you know, much more simpler task. 
But say we wanted to take that same situation and just like increase the amount of work that we want to we want to do with that. So say you wanted to uh, set parameters like, hey, is this user in the admin group? Hey, is uh, we want to make sure that it's in alphabetical order. Hey, we want to make sure that um, the passwords that we're changing are only the people with the number one starting on their hash or something like that. So uh, that being said, um, Bash does not have though that like functionality to handle so many things and although it kind of does for the most part it won't handle them very well python is pro uh, has significantly more functionality to i'm sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, just moving forward. So Python has significantly more functionality to handle those kind of parameters in a much more fluid way. So um, pretty much with that, that's kind of like the main thing, the main takeaway is just to understand that um, Python is going to be a better use case if you have significantly more things that you need to handle or uh, you're, the scope of the project is much bigger. If it's smaller, Bash is probably going to be your better bet. Um, next slide, please. And so just a quick pro tip that we think we want that we wanted to share with you um, is the differentiation between smart quotes and dumb quotes. <laughs> so um, this is kind of more pertaining to a problem like say you're writing this, um, say you're writing your code like on a Word document or something and you wanted to transfer it over to like visual code or, or something like that. The thing um, is that uh, word processors will actually change um, the quote or the quotes or the double primes that you would usually have in visual code or something like that to actual grammatical quotes. So the uh, com um, the programming language that you're using is probably not going to register them when you transfer them back over. So just to make that distinction, you want to make sure that when you were transferring things back and forth, that you do have double primes set, because if not, you are going to run into errors if um, when, when you transfer one over to the other. Uh, uh, with that, I will be passing it over to Win from the lovely dot script to take over uh, for variables. Thank you, Luis. Um, so what are variables? Oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> uh, if you think of variables in math, we have variables for things like functions, and they change accordingly to whatever problem we're doing. Sometimes we know what value it is, and sometimes we don't know what value it is. The similar idea in programming. Variables are values that can change depending on what we're doing in our program. Variables essentially store data and they will store these as different types like integers, strings, or floats. And in Python specifically, we don't have to declare the type. So if you notice here, when we wanna set variable x to be an integer, we just type an integer. So x equals five. Then if we want it to be a string, then we type whatever we want and put that into quotes. We can change types by reassigning the set variable. For example, we first initialized variable x as five, an integer, and then change x to Steve, a string type, overriding the initial five integer. We can also change the type by casting. And casting is when you convert variables from one type, for example, an integer, to another type, like a string. For example, we cast y as a string, so five in this case is a string and not an integer. Variable names are also case sensitive. Lower, for example, lowercase x is not the same as uppercase x, so there's no overriding occurring here. We also have names that are okay to use versus names that are not okay to use, as shown here on the right. The first two are naming conventions that are okay, while the last two are not okay. So for here, we know that we're not allowed to name our variables with a number in the beginning or with a space. Next slide, please. Like in Python, when writing variables in Bash, we do not need to declare the type. To create a variable, you would need to type in the name of your variable followed by the equal sign, and then the value that you want to assign your variable. Here, we are assigning the string cute to the variable name dogs. As we had mentioned earlier with Python, we can reassign variables and change the type. The same applies for Bash. So what previous string value we had, we can override it with something like an integer value. Bash is also similar to Python in that the variable names are case sensitive. So if we had a capital D instead of a lowercase d, then these variables would be different. If we wanted to see the value we have stored in our variable, we can use the echo command. There are different ways that you can print a variable. So if you wanted to print the variable name itself, you would use the echo command and follow the format on the left side of this example. And if we wanted to print the value of the variable, we would follow the format on the right side. 
And if you notice, we need to add like a little dollar sign before printing the value of a variable. And this is because this is how our program distinguishes our variable as an actual variable. Briefly mentioned earlier, uh, there are different naming conventions that you can use when it comes to variables with multiple words. These are three common examples. Camel case is when all words are capitalized except for the first word. Snake case is when words are separated by underscores. And Pascal case is when all the words are capitalized. No rule, there's no rule really in what you should use, but just keep in mind readability and consistency. And by consistency, we mean if you use camel case to name one variable in your program, try, try not to use snake case to name another variable. Um, and with that, I will bring it back to you, Luis, to talk about types. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. So um, just building off what uh, Wynn has said up to this point, right, in terms of variables, uh, data types are what we can think of more as categories under which variables will probably start to fall under, right? So the, poor, the four primary categories that um, I'll be walking you guys through right now is going to be characters, numbers, Boolean values, and loops, uh, and lists, my bad. Uh, a couple things to note before we do get started in terms of like the actual intricacies in between is that um, pretty much like types do not have to be declared in either Python or Bash. So taking that into consideration, um, something that you would see in like Java or other different types of programming languages, um, you would have to initialize them by saying, you know, like char var or char whatever x is going to equal to Swift and, and what have you, right? So that's something that you don't have to declare in either Python or Bash. So I guess it's a little nicer. Um, the other thing too is to understand um, that Bash make sure to not leave any spaces in between when you're going to be assigning variables. <laughs> um, Bash will actually register them partially as like a value. So you will get error codes um, if you leave a space in between. So that's something um, as Gabe is pointing out right over there. You want to make sure that there's no spaces in between when you have your equal signs and such. So that's something you don't have to worry about over with Python. And most other programming, high level programming languages have already kind of mitigated that. But moving on to the nitty gritty table that we got down over here, right? Um, we split this up within Python assignments at the top and bash over at the bottom. The characters and numbers um, assignments are fairly straightforward. Of course, uh, just got to make sure you have the double primes if you want to be specific for the characters. <laughs> um, and for numbers, you don't really have to have anything. It's they're just assigned that number value. So fairly straightforward. When we get, do get to Boolean, uh, to Boolean values though, we it's good to understand that um, Python has assigned uh, keywords, right? So true and false are like reserved to make sure that like they are going to be utilized um, in, you know, like in this equation, so to speak. Uh, Bash, on the other hand, does not have such a thing. So it will actually, you have to make sure that you differentiate the two by adding a one value if it's going to be uh, true and a zero if it's going to be false. Um, from there, we go into the intricacies of lists and this is kind of where I was, uh, this is kind of calling back over to what I was talking about in the beginning where we're having much more functionality and characters that Python does have. So it allows for like these different in intricacies to happen. So like you can see where uh, we have commas for separation. There's no, um, it doesn't register the spaces and stuff. Um, but for the most part, it seems to be fairly similar, but you just wanna make sure that when you do have like uh, these different intricacies happening, that you wanna be aware of like spacing and small little issues like that. But other than that, that's pretty much uh, the whole thing on data types. From here, I'll be letting uh, Gabe take over for conditions. Thank you very much, Luis. And yeah, so first thing we're gonna talk about when it comes to conditionals is what's known as pseudocode. Um, pseudocode isn't a particular programming language, but it's basically just a way of writing like an English sentence, like a normal way that we normally speak in a way that's structured like code. So that way, when we're converting whatever we want to do into code, we can kind of like figure out which part of the sentence, which part of the task that our code is doing. So as you can see here, we have our human directions. And it says, check the weather. If it's going to rain, I need to wear boots. Otherwise, I will wear sneakers. And we have highlighted and color coded each part of the sentence to you know, show you which part is where. This first part, check the weather and see if it's going to rain. Well, when we turn that into pseudocode, we just say, if it's raining, and it's basically just you know, 
in the structure. And then it says, I need to wear boots. And this I need to wear boots, we'll call that case number one. So if it's raining, it's going to perform case number one. Otherwise, or in this case, else, which is just another word for otherwise, do I will wear sneakers, which we'll call case number two. So it's going to be structured like if it's raining, wear boots, you know, otherwise else, wear sneakers, case number two. And this is still pretty much an English sentence, but when we look at how it looks like in Python and Bash, you'll see it's actually very similar to the structure. It's just the actual, you know, language specific implementation that changes. Um, so in this case, um, oh yeah, and I'll cover what the phi is at the, at the end. Um, in Python, if we want to say if it's raining or like check the status of raining, we could say if weather, which would be some variable, equals equals rain. In this case, rain is inside of these uh, double straight quotes or dumb quotes or double primes. And that's basically, is, as we said, this is a string. Uh, so this is literally text. And this equals equals symbol is basically a operator that will see if these two things are the same. Uh, you could think of it as, is it equal to? So whether, is it equal to rain? And then if that's true, it's going to do print wear boots. And print is just a Python command that allows you to you know, display text. It's important to note that there is this colon here. Uh, that's basically signaling or telling Python that this is the end of this condition and that the next stuff is going to be you know, the, the case. Another thing to note here is that it's indented the way that Python works is that it uses the white space to kind of show what part of the code is belonging to like which condition. For example, print wear boots, since it's indented underneath if weather equals equals rain, it knows, okay, print wear boots is the case for this condition. And if we were to have more lines of code all indented at the same level as this print wear boots, Python would know, okay, all of these commands are supposed to be run if this condition is true. And now we see else is down here, but if you look, it's actually on the same indent level as if. Therefore, Python knows, okay, this signals the end of that uh, condition block right here, and this is going to be its own condition block. This else operator also has a colon here, and it's going to basically say, you know, print where sneakers instead. And as you can see, it's indented here to show that this line of code belongs to this else block. Um, so in bash, more or less, it's the same thing. Um, it's not going to be controlled by white space, um, but it's actually going to be using this like semicolon then statement. Normally, though, we do still indent just to make things easier to read as a human, even though it's not as important for bash, it's just nice to read. So this section right here, this uh, you know, dollar sign weather, tac eq rain, is essentially the same thing here. Tac eq is basically short for equals. So if weather, the variable weather, because it has the dollar sign, equals rain, then yeah, you know, do this part. It's important to note here that we have these square brackets here and that there's a space before and after the square bracket. That is important. It will not work the same if you do not have spaces. So we wanna make sure we have spaces there. And then the then statement is basically going to say the equivalent of this colon, which is that this is the end of that condition and everything afterwards is going to be the code or the case that we're going to be running. In this case, case number one, which is echo wear boots. Then the next case is going to be the else, and it's going to you know, echo wear sneakers. Um, in this case, Bash isn't looking for the white space, you know, returning to the same indent level. It's just looking for a, key, a specific keyword. In this case, else was the first keyword that matched. And then after the else finishes, the next keyword is going to be looking for is fi. And 
if you didn't notice, uh, fi is just the you know opposite of if or if, and that basically just tells Bash, okay, this is the end of this if you know this long if statement, and that's why it's like that. Um, that's basically a a Bash thing, and uh, you just have to kind of remember it. Sometimes if you're like writing in Bash scripts, you might forget the fi, and then it'll be running a whole you know, bunch of stuff that you're not expecting. So it's important to just remember that if you have an if, it needs to end in fi. Um, other than that, I think we can head on to loops. So I'll be passing that over to Shivam. Uh, hello. So if we go to the next slide, we can see the two main loops that are used in Python, which are for loops and while loops. Um, so for a loop, uh, basically goes over, goes over a list or a, um, it goes over a list or a set of characters and checks through each um, individual character or item in the list. So in this um, example, we can see that we have a list called car brands where you, you have different car brands, Toyota, BMW, Tesla, and Jeep. Now the for loop, as in the example below the car brands list, uh, shows that it iterates over every single car brand inside of the list car brand and prints each brand. And it gives a condition that if brands to the Hyundai, it will stop iterating over each of the, um, um, each of the uh, strings in the list to, um, for the for loop. So the um, output you'd get in this, um, for loop would be Toyota, BMW, Tesla, and Jeep because it iterates and prints out each of the strings within the list, but it doesn't break the for loop because uh, there's no the, the condition if Hyundai is not fulfilled. Okay, and you can see that in Bash is essentially the same thing um, as you can see on the next slide. In Bash, it is the same thing except for the fact that there's a difference in syntax. But in essence, it does iterate over the sequence. It, it, um, it echoes, it prints each car brand within our list, car brands. Um, and since, again, the condition if brand equals to Hyundai is not fulfilled, it will print out every brand within car brands and then uh, terminate the code because there's no, no, no more um, strings left in the list. Now, if we go back, we can see an example of a while loop in Python. So a while loop, um, rather than iterating over different, um, different strings in a list or different characters within a string, a while loop iterates until a condition is true. So in this example, we can see um, a more mathematical while loop where we have this variable i, which is set equal to zero. Now, since i is less than six, while i is less than six, it prints out i and adds one to i. So it would print out i equals to zero, then, then it will add one to i, making i equal to one. Then it repeats it because the condition i is less than six is still true because i is equal to one. Now it prints it again, i is equal to one, then it adds one to i. Then it, i is equal to two, it prints out two, and so on and so forth until it prints out i is equal to five because um, if we have the condition i is equal to five the while loop will still execute because five is less than six it'll print out five and add one onto um, i making a six but now that i is equal to six our while loop is no longer fulfilled therefore it will go on to the next step or terminate the code now we can see that the condition is still true in bash, the while loop, um, where it essentially does the same thing, where we have i is equal to zero and iterates over the while loop, printing out zero, one, two, three, four, five, but not six, because the condition i equals um, i is less than six is broken then. So those are two basic loops. Um, you can see that they're both used have the same use cases in um, Python and Bash, um, but they have different syntaxes, of course, because of the different languages. Um, yeah, so I'd like to pass it on to the next speaker to talk about libraries. Thank you very much, Shivam. And yeah, I'll be talking about libraries. Um, so first thing we're gonna talk about, what is a library? No, it's not you know the place where you go onto campus to study and do your homework. Uh, so 
in programming, a library is actually, you could think of it as pre-written code made by someone probably smarter than you who already figured out how to do something else, right? And he or she assumes like you might need to use this code. So they add it to a library and then you can then import or install that library into your own program, your own script. So you can use their pre-built functionality um, so you don't have to do that work yourself, basically. So you can kind of think of it as you take your script, you slap on somebody else's library, and then you get a much more advanced script, you know, that has all of the library's functionality. And it's pretty much that simple. The main thing that you have to understand when it comes to libraries is like how you might go about installing them. Uh, one thing I do have to note is in Bash, uh, all of what you, you know, normally comes with Bash is known as the standard library. Uh, similar with Python, all the stuff that comes in with Python that comes by default without importing anything extra is known as a standard library. But for Bash, you don't really use anything outside of the standard library. And that's because if you need you know, a new program or a new binary utility, you just install that binary utility and then you call it in Bash, right? For Python, libraries are more formalized uh, and used in more like normal traditional programming languages like you know, Java and C. Uh, and that's just because of the different use cases of Bash and Python, where Python is a more traditional programming language. Here we can see this command pip. Pip stands for like pip install packages. It's a recursive acronym, kind of funny. But basically it allows you to install a library from like, you know, the open internet if you don't have it already on your system. So for example, uh, let's say that there's this library, you know, beautiful soup four. It's just the name of a library. And we can use pip install that. So if we don't have beautiful soup already on our computer, then it'll install it. Another thing to note is that there are different commands for different versions of Python. So for Python 3, we just use pip3. Now, once we have the overarching library installed in our computer, we can then import specific libraries that were you know, part of that. Um, so you could think of this as like the library package, and then this is the individual Python library. Um, and it's really simple. You just type it import, and then whatever you know, you're trying to import at the top of your Python scripts, and then it will add that to your script. So we import beautiful soup, and then we could now, you know, create a variable named soup that implements beautiful soups functionality or something else. And it's pretty much that simple. You just gotta research which libraries you may need. You have to kind of be able to figure out, okay, if I don't have the library package, do I need to install it first? And then can I import it? And sometimes that happens if you're either, uh, you know, like copy pasting code from, I don't know, Stack Overflow or something like that, that uses a particular library. Uh, a very common one is like PyCrypto. Sometimes you might need to install that. Um, or like JSON depends on, you know, whatever environment you're, you're using when you're using Python. So it's just something to, to note. Uh, another thing to know about libraries is that Python by default comes with a lot of libraries that you don't have to install, but they're also not part of the standard library. So uh, one of the ones that we're going to be talking about that falls under that case is actually regular expressions. So I'll pass it back over to Shivam to talk about that. Okay, so regular expressions. Uh, let me show you guys the next slide. So you see the set of numbers uh, with different uh, lengths of each of the terms. Um, what do you guys recognize this as? I, I, whenever I see a sequence of numbers like this, I see it as a phone number. But like, how do we know that this is a phone number? How do we, how can we just like recognize that? Um, well, this is not a neurology presentation, but what we're talking about is how we can make a computer recognize this set of sequence as a phone number. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, how the computer recognizes things is known as re regex, better known or more expanded as regular expression. So uh, regular expression um, are just a set of expressions that help identify a certain sequence of characters within your code or within a text. 
Um, it is built into libraries, um, libraries as Gabriel talked about, um, that you can import into many languages, including Python and Java. Um, and of course, the way you use it, the syntax of um, the regex libraries are different language to language, but in essence, they're all the same theory. So um, when talking about regex, there are two flags that um, you are typically working with. One flag is um, typically called global, where it checks, um, checks for um, the specified sequence uh, globally on your whole code. Another flag you can use is case insensitive, where you can specify for your search uh, whether or not you want to be case sensitive or not, you know, including uh, capital letters or not. Um, and regex is a really powerful too, tool because um, it lets us search throughout all our code for a very, very specific uh, a sequence of um, characters. And you know you can use regex to really, really specify each sequence of characters. And more than that, you can identify and replace or edit that certain sequence of characters, uh, which is a pretty handy and powerful tool because um, I know personally in my experience, if I wanted to you know change a variable, I would just you know set a variable um, at the top of the code and then change it later on. But um, you know, it's going through my head where I can use regex to more intuitively uh, edit around the variables I've made. Um, so I would like to show some examples of um, regex to you guys. Um, so this is a pretty cool website um, I found when looking into regex. Oh, uh, and you'll be able to screen share. Yeah, Taylor, can you uh, let Shavom screen share and then we'll be taking yeah. over that part. Try again. I mean, try harder. Okay. So this is a website um, called Regexer, which is pretty handy um, for um, more beginner knowledge of using um, regex. So um, here. So I had this example, which you can use regex to, um, which you can use different techniques of regex to. Um, better understand. Um, so first thing is these flags. So as I before explained, global tag will search through the whole short story, while um, case insensitive um, flags, as you can see, adds an I at the end, will search through the whole story regardless of you know, the case sensitivity. So the most basic thing you can do is a letter for um, you know, a regular expression to just search through the whole text. So let's say you were looking for the letter L throughout the whole story. It will search through the whole story and uh, identify which letter Ls are there, right? Now, that's not as far as it goes. You can do more. One is you can add a, um, another letter. Let's say, let's say you have an L and a plus. So this will show that it will list out every L, but the distinction is that if there's multiple Ls, it'll list that as one identification rather than two separate ones. Another thing we can do is um, uh, this question mark um, quantifier. So let's say you wanted to find um, a word that had the letter T and an L in front of it. So what it would do is it'll look through every single case right? And you can see it identifies every single T in this list, but the question mark um, expresses that if it has an L in front of it, it will include that in its identification, but it is not required. As you can see, this T has been highlighted without having an L in front of it. So this question mark kind of just shows that the letter before it is not required, but if it's there, it will include it with its um, regular expression identification. So, you know, this is just a basic um, identifications you can use with regex, but uh, there's more practical usages. So um, let me change my screen again. Okay. So again, you can use it in your code as well. So um, as, as 
previously stated, regular expressions are a um, library and you can import libraries into your code. So if I were to import re, that's, um, that's importing the regular expression into my code, okay? So um, let's say we were having a pretty simple code. Let me pull it up. This is our text. So let's say we have this text, which says today, the day today is 09 2020 right? Now, if we were to print out the text, uh, hopefully it will obviously show that the day today is 2020, right? But let's say you wanted to edit around the, um, how it expresses the date today, right? So you can use regex to um, actually change that. So let me pull it up. Uh, yeah. So now we use we the um, re the re for regular expression that we imported. We have some um, we have some functions uh, attached with it. So one is re sub re um, substitution, and I identified as we know in regex we identified a. Um, a set of characters which have, as you can see here, um, a, a, um, a, a digit separated by slash with a digit separated by slash with a digit, right? And these pluses show that it can be um, a number plus as many more numbers in front. So this, um, the computer is able to identify this using regex as it's a number a set of numbers separated by slash with other numbers separated by slash with other numbers. And then we replace it with a different formatting, okay? And once we replace it with a different formatting, we set that as text one. So we're using regex to change how we express. We use regex to identify the date and change how we express it. And yeah, and we can see that in action as we print text one again. So if we run if we run the code again, we'll see that before we'll see that before we had the old formatting for our date, but after our, our editing using regex, we we're able to change how we express our date. So that's just a simple and more practical example of um, the uses of regex, but I hope you guys have an idea of how useful it can be in terms of changing and moving around variables. Yeah, and I will add. So basically that is the, okay. So that is the basic overview of scripting and I will share my screen again. So that is the basic overview of scripting. And this is basically just showing you guys basically what you guys have learned uh, so far. Um, again, when it comes to both Python and Bash, a lot of the times it, you got to kind of figure out what you're trying to do in that particular language. And that's why on Friday, we're going to be having a workshop where we're going to be having multiple projects uh, that you can complete in both. So both bash and python and that will help you guys get some practice with actually you know writing bash writing python so then it'll become more natural to you when you you know encounter it in your it or cybersecurity careers because both bash and python are going to be used like everywhere when it comes to these kinds of things um, another thing that i did want to mention is that on friday we're going to be having two different tracks meaning that one of them is going to be uh, more entry level. So if you've never used you know, programming, you've never done scripting in Bash or Python before, that is you know, A-OK, -okay. that track is meant for you. We'll be covering some basic use cases or simple scripts that can kind of get you warmed up to the whole scripting world. And if you're a little bit more advanced, you've either you know, maybe used a different programming language before or you're just already comfortable in either Bash or Python, 
then we'll have a more advanced track for you to kind of get an example with learning a little bit more advanced concepts such as classes and such for uh, Python. Um, when it comes to bash scripting, there's only so much you can really do, as Luis mentioned towards the beginning of our presentation, bash, the scope of which is, is a little bit smaller since it's more meant for, you know, being a command line interpreter. Um, but, you know, we've, we've got plenty of material for anyone who wants to improve. So definitely come out to our Friday workshop. And with that, the last thing that I'll kind of leave you guys off with is if you have any questions or comments about anything that we covered today, feel free to ask below in the chat box. Uh, we're here to help you guys out. And if you have no other questions or, or concerns, then uh, that's about all we have for today. Um, I know rejects can be very confusing. So if you guys would like to learn a little bit more while we have a couple of minutes left, I'd be happy to show you guys some things. But yeah, that's what we have for today. Thank you guys for coming. You've been a wonderful audience. And yeah. Awesome sauce, Gabe and folks from dot slash script. Uh, there's actually one regex resource. Uh, if you like literally type in learn regex, there's a kind of like an interactive way to learn regex, but it's a chat over here. Um, I don't use regex too often, but whenever I need to relearn regex, which is every time I use regex, I have to relearn it. Um, I go to this, this website, and this is a pretty nice way to get started with regex, become a, a regex guru. With that, yeah, I'm just gonna stop the recording now. So for those watching on YouTube, goodbye.